I think we can start. Dear all, um, my name is Daniel Jubilic. I'm the director of the Office of Equal Opportunities of the City of Heidelberg, and at the same time, vice president of the European Coalition of Cities Against Racism. In the name of Queen, the Queer European Asylum Network, I want to thank you for joining us in the second part of our symposium, especially after this dense conversation we had in the first panel. Um, we want to talk about solidarity. Um, LGBTIQ activists currently face growing opposition across Europe. The LGBTIQ community, especially in many Central, Eastern and Southeastern European countries is increasingly exposed to institutional anti-LGBTIQ rhetoric and homo and transphobic attitudes resulting in various forms of political and societal discrimination. Moreover, the growing anti-LGBTIQ coalition is closely linked to and feeds of the anti-gender movement. The latter is a vast network of actors mobilizing against gender and sexual equality and diversity. Trans women are often principal target of the anti-gender movement's campaign. They become scapegoats for societal changes around binary gender identities and sexual equality. We want to discuss how can LGBTIQ movements in Europe form solidarity networks to strengthen the support of queer asylum claimants? What actions should LGBTIQ organizations and movements all across Europe take to put political pressure on European governments? Before I hand over to Lilith Raza, um, who will moderate um, the interventions in the first part of the panel, um, and will introduce also our wonderful lineup of speakers to discuss these issues, I want to inform you about some housekeeping rules um, for a productive meeting. So I want to ask you um, to please keep your mics and cameras switched off during the conversation. The introduction, you already saw it, and the presentations will be recorded in the speaker view. The Q&A in the breakout rooms we have planned later um, will not be recorded. For the Q&A, you will be able to submit questions via the chat function below. Um, to the moderators directly throughout the Zoom meeting. So you can already, when you have already ideas and questions during the interventions, please feel free to type it in the chat. Um, and please note that we won't be able to answer any case specific questions you might have, as we unfortunately can't offer support to individual cases now during the meeting. If you need advice regarding your case, please visit the Queer European Asylum website under www.queereuropeanasylum.org where you find some useful links and also access to counseling institutions and experts. Um, and please follow us also on Twitter under um, Queer Euro Asylum and tweet about the symposium using the hashtags um, Queer Dublin and Queer Asylum. Our event will start with four interventions by our round table of experts. Afterwards, we will have a discussion. There's time for a Q&A in the plenary. Um, and as I already said, you can submit questions via the chat function um, during the interventions. In the second part, you all have the possibility to discuss these issues further with us in our breakout rooms, moderated by our, our experts. And we will together develop political recommendations that are again, in the end, will be collected in the plenary. But now we'll hand over to Lili Draza. I'm very happy um, to be your co-chair for this session today. Lilith is one of the leading experts on LGBTIQ asylum in Germany. She is herself a trans woman with migration background and is working um, for the rights of LGBTIQ refugees and asylum seekers in Germany since 2015. Since November 2017, she is working for the LSVD, the Lesbian and Gay Federation in Germany, the largest non-governmental LGBTIQ rights organization here in the country, and is coordinating the project um, Queer Refuse, uh, Refugees Deutschland. The aim of the project is to network the structures uh, existing throughout Germany, the many local initiatives, um, as well as refugee LGBTIQ activists. There was just a huge meeting she organized, a very successful one um, last weekend in Cologne, and to support them in their work. At the same time, Lilith is also one of the co-founders of our Queer European Asylum Network. I'm very happy to hand over to you, Lilith. 
Thank you, Daniel. That's very nice of you for your uh, words. Um, so I am Lilith and I would like to introduce my uh, panelists for today and I will start with Knut. Uh, Knut Westerstein is a founding member of the Rimbos Refugees Frankfurt, established in October 2015 and was a member of its board from 2016 till 2019. Knud is currently the coordinator of Rainbow Refugee Support Group at the Aidshilfe Frankfurt. And Knud and I, we are working also very close uh, when it comes to individual cases in the uh, federal state of Hessen. Uh, he further supports the LGBTIQ refugees with their asylum claims uh, and their access to queer groups as well as medical and psychological treatment. Thank you, Knud, for being here today. Our second panelist is uh, Milena Adamczewska. She is a lawyer uh, holding an LLM in international human rights law, specializing in anti-discrimination law and protection of LGBTIQ plus rights. From 2018 to 2020 in the Department of Equal Treatment in the Office of Commissioner for Human Rights, was she responsible for the cases related to SOGI, sexual orientation and gender identity. In her work, she included the set strategic litigation against the so-called LGBT free zones in Poland. Nowadays, she coordinates the Law Does Not Exclude Fund, which supports LGBTIQ people in need of legal aid. Thank you, Milena, for your time and for your uh, energies to be here with us today. Our third panelist is Tina Kolosh. I hope I am saying it right. Tina Kolosh Orban. Uh, they were born and raised and are still based in Hungary. They come from a working class background and Kolosh uh, are vice president and responsible for the international relations and advocacy of a transgender association called Transvanilla since 2011. They have been serving on Transgender Europe's board and on the International Trans Funds grant making panel in the past. Thank you a lot, uh, Tina Kolosh, for being here today with us. We know that you are having a lot of health issues these days. We hope it gets better soon, but still it's an honor to be with you today here. Thank you, thanks a lot. And last but not the least, we have our last panelist. They are Biljana Ginova, and they are advocacy manager at the ERA for almost 20 years. That's quite a lot of expertise that they bring with themselves. And they have been dedicated to improving the status and political visibility of different marginalized communities in the North Macedonia. They are well um, they are also well networked with many LGBTIQ organizations and activists in the Western Balkans and Turkey region and beyond. They have co-founded and held positions in the steering boards of ERA and the European Lesbian Conference contributing to providing their experience and practical knowledge in leadership, supervision and management. They are also uh, in advocacy and capacity building, as well as in strengthening relationships with donors and other stakeholders active. As a recipient of a Shevening Award, they have obtained their MA from the University of Sussex, focusing their research in the field of queer international relationships. Thank you, Biljana Genova, for being here today with us. And thanks a lot for your time and your energies to speak about the very important topic which is most uh, which is about the uh, networking and solidarity regarding the lgbtiq movements in germany and in eastern europe so now i will hand it over to my uh, colleague from germany knud westerstein uh, he will uh, present his uh, presentation and then we will move towards the other panelists thank you knud for being here the stage is yours thank you Lilith, for this warm introduction here and uh, yeah, thank you that I can be here and uh, share my perspective and what I saw on the cases of queer asylum seekers from um, who have Dublin cases, who are in Germany and uh, who have 
Dublin cases in European countries um, from the Western Balkan and East Europe. So um, just to give you a rough impression of uh, what I am doing, I'm uh, doing the uh, counseling of queer asylum seekers here in Frankfurt. Um, our work is uh, state-sponsored work. We are um, receiving our our uh, the money for our work from the government of the federal state of Hessen, and um, we have started um, this project in 2017. And since then, there have been roughly 300 asylum seekers with a LGBT background who have been um, coming to our offer to reach out to us and uh, who we could support. Um, I thought it would be good to start off with uh, some statistics. Statistics is always maybe um, helpful to get a better impression on um, how many cases there would be and um, how often it affects um, the cases of queer asylum seekers when they are here in Germany, that they have a Dublin case. So I would like to show you the figures. So um, the figures of the Dublin cases in the German asylum systems, the source is the uh, German Bundestag and um, it came out on the 21st of June in 2022. Um, first of all, I would like to give you the impression on how many people have a so-called Dublin case um, when they start their asylum process here in Germany. And uh, so I'm giving you the numbers of the takeover requests from Germany to European members of the Dublin regulation in 2020. And um, yeah, it is a very high number. It's 30,135 from all asylum applications. Um, it's 29.4%. So uh, you can imagine it is a topic which is, of course, um, occurring very often when we are um, having LGBT asylum seekers coming to our offer. Um, I listed up the top four European countries a takeover requests from Germany. So you have an imagination um, which countries usually the asylum seekers, also the queer asylum seekers uh, would arrive at. And um, when they're coming to Germany to start their asylum process, um, where which countries would be identified for them that they ha would have to go through their asylum process due to the Dublin regulation. So uh, top four is Greece at uh, has 22.4%. That's a very high number. Italy, 17.6%. France, 11.11%. And Sweden, 8.5%. 8 so this Summing it up, it is more than 50% already. Um, as we are discussing the matter of the Dublin cases um, from the German perspective, um, who have for could have, for example, a visa from Poland or for another country from the Eastern Europe or from the Western Balkan. Um, I would like to give you the figures which we have there. Um, take our request from Germany to members of Eastern Europe and Western Balkans. Hungary is 1%. Slovenia is 1%. Bulgaria is 1.6%. Croatia, 2.6%. Romania, 3.6%. And Poland um, has the highest number, 3.9%. So in total, let's a bit more than 10% of um, the numbers, which I gave you before. Now, um, 
it might be interesting to learn about the uh, numbers of deportations which are actually taking place. And uh, we have to say that in 2020, um, it was quite a low number, but that was mainly to uh, the pandemic and to the travel restrictions. But nevertheless, it might be interesting to also see um, where people would be sent to when uh, deportation works out um, in regard to the Dublin regulation. And already a quarter of the deportations from Germany would end up in France. It's 24.5%. Italy, oh, I'm sorry, I misspelled that. It's 70.2% uh, and Netherlands 10. 8%. You might be asking, there were so many Dublin cases um, from Greece. Uh, so you can see deportations to Greece. Somehow they, they, they don't take place at all from Germany. Yeah. And um, now we would like to look at the figures of um, Eastern Europe and Western Balkans destination countries from Germany in regard to the Dublin regulation, also in 2020. Hungary, there was none. And uh, yeah, I would like to emphasize, of course, this is the, the number of uh, all, it's not, not about LGBT asylum seekers, of course, it's about just all the asylum seekers. And Hungary, actually, there was no deportation from Germany to Hungary since 2017. Um, I just learned that there was one deportation to Hungary um, in the beginning um, of this year, 2021. Yeah, the other figures are Bulgaria, 0.6%, Romania, 0.9%, Croatia, 0.9%, Czech Republic, 2% and Poland for percent So what we see is that the deportations to Poland um, from the asylum seekers, if they have a Dublin case, they seem to work fairly well from the view of the German government well. <laughs> now I would like to speak about my personal experiences, which um, I had since um, I've been dealing with um, LGBT asylum cases and uh, rainbow refugees support. Um, we had since 2017, um, five cases where um, there was a Dublin case and the destination um, was either in Eastern Europe. Yeah, it was in Eastern Europe. There was none to Western Balkan countries. So there were three um, to Poland, one to Slovenia and uh, one Romania. Um, all of them were homosexual men. And um, yeah, just if um, the asylum seeker has a Dublin case, it doesn't necessarily mean that a deportation will take place. So I would like to give you also those numbers. The deportation carried out, which we saw, um, were both, uh, no, one was to Poland and uh, one was to Slovenia. And um, we have been speaking uh, we, we learned before that um, there is a deportation deadline. It could be either six months or it could be up to 18 months. Um, and two of our cases, there the deportation deadline expired. And therefore, um, Germany took over the asylum process. And um, in one case, the BAMF declared the self-entry. Um, that means that um, our Federal Office of Migration and Asylum decided um, that the asylum process could start here in Germany. And that was in the case of a homosexual man from Iraq who had a um, Dublin case in Poland. Um, his case was special because um, we were having 
we could we could keep it at court. Um, usually the administration code courts in Germany who are responsible for the cases of the asylum seekers um, are um, giving uh, negative decisions very fastly if um, a Dublin case asylum seeker would uh, go to court and fight for a positive decision. But in his case it was that um, the judge saw that the person um, had a psychological issue and um, tra transport to Poland would not have been possible. And therefore, um, it took a long time for the case um, where it was still at court. And at some point, the BAMF decided that um, it would step in and take over the asylum case by themselves, which we, of course, were very happy to learn about. Um, and also, maybe it's interesting to see what happened to the persons who got deported, one to Poland, one to Slovenia. The person to, who got deported to Poland um, actually in the end decided to um, take back his asylum case and went back to the country which he fled from, which was Azerbaijan. And um, this person actually now found a legal way to come to Germany through work migration and we're supporting that person here. So it looks like we have a happy end on this part, but it was very interesting to learn from his experience that it was um, from his point of view, not possible to go through a asylum process in Poland. I'm quite sure that we will hear more about the situation in Poland later on when Milena will continue. Yeah. And uh, the other case uh, where a person got deported to Slovenia, that person also didn't see um, Slovenia as an option to go through the asylum process and decided to return to Germany and uh, went into the process again. And then also due to the psychological situation of that person, um, the bump decided um, to take over the case and he is now um, granted with a um, with, with this asylum here in Germany. Yeah. So this is my impression, which I can give you just from what I learned, how um, it is to deal with um, the cases of asylum seekers who have a Dublin case in either Eastern Europe or the West Balkan. Um, of course, you can see the number is very low, um, but I would like to say that this also means it is important to especially look at those cases because there is not much knowledge on that. And therefore, I'm very happy that uh, we are having um, today this online symposium where we can talk about these issues because, um, of course, every asylum case is an individual case and so forth has to be regarded um, especially. And so therefore, it is it matters that we are discussing this topic. Yeah. All right. This is uh, what I would like to say from my side. Thank you very much for giving me the option <laughs> to speak. Thank you, Knut. That was really good prepared. And uh, you gave us all the uh, details and the statistics regarding the deportations when it comes to Dublin three regulations. Thanks a lot. Uh, so after the presentation from Knud, uh, I would like to invite Milena Adam Cveska for her presentation and for her input into this uh, panel today. Thank you, Milena. Thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, very interesting presentation. And uh, yes, I think that my slides are being displayed, but I would like to start with uh, 
very short introduction of uh, my perspective that I'll be speaking from. So firstly, I wanted to mention that uh, I am a privileged ally. So I'm not an LGBTQ plus person and I'm not an asylum seeker and I don't have migration experience. Uh, I'm also a lawyer, so you will see that my presentation will be very legal in a sense, but I hope that uh, uh, even though understandable, but of course, feel free to ask uh, some questions if I will be running too fast through something. Uh, and then finally, um, the information I get, so basically where my experiences come from is uh, mostly from uh, my work in the Office of the Commissioner for Human Rights, which was actually uh, mentioned before. So the public entity, which is entitled to monitor um, the work of other uh, state actors. So that was a very crucial experience that I got in that office. Currently, I'm working in a non-government organization, Love Does Not Exclude, where I coordinate Law Does Not Exclude a project and fund where we grant uh, legal aid to LGBTIQ plus um, uh, as, um, community members. And finally, two small remarks about uh, the language and terms that I'll be using. Uh, I might use sometimes the shorter abbreviation of LGBT community or LGBTI community, but every time I actually refer to LGBTIQ plus community as a whole. And the same with uh, asylum seekers, I might say refugees or migrants, but uh, I, in any case, refer to refugees and asylum seekers uh, under Dublin 3 regulation, because this is mostly what we discuss here today. Uh, and uh, the question that is displayed uh, on the slide, so is Poland a safe country for um, LGBTIQ plus asylum seekers is actually what I would like to address today followed by the question how we can make it safer uh, but actually for that i'll probably not have enough time uh, during this first intervention so i hope that we'll be able to discuss more in the breakout rooms uh, actually how to strengthen this international pressure international collaboration um, to yes to make poland safer for lgbtq plus asylum seekers uh, so if i can ask for the next slide please uh, the question can be actually addressed uh, from uh, different angles, um, because of course there is the legal perspective for all the problems that LGBTIQ plus asylum seekers face, uh, but this is very strongly related also to the social perspective, so the social attitudes, and um, one actually influenced the other. Uh, and then secondly, um, the group that we are discussing, um, it um, is immediately linked to the intersectional perspective on this group, right? Because we talk about uh, people who have uh, migration experience, who are refugees or asylum seekers, and at the same time are the members of LGBTIQ plus community. And you also see during my presentation that this intersectional approach uh, to the issue is uh, crucial because uh, actually the experiences of these group members um, well, sometimes double the discrimination um, they face. Uh, so I will try to touch uh, upon like all these angles mixed together. They are of course interlinked also somehow. Um, however, as I'm more a lawyer, um, I will of course focus a little bit more on the legal perspective and only touch upon the social one uh, on the basis of some, uh, I think, interesting statistics. And if I can ask for the next slide. Uh, so what I would like to start with uh, now, uh, jumping into this social perspective, is that um, it is in Poland very much influenced by um, something that can be only called hate campaigns, uh, triggered by um, the government and the public media, uh, which are also state controlled. Uh, so mostly during the national elections, parliamentary elections, uh, the current ruling party, Law and Justice, um, found um, this political move of uh, choosing an enemy, choosing the other group, uh, right? And uh, using hate and prejudice towards that group for political aims. In 2015 elections, um, refugees were that group. And what you can see on the slide are um, front pages of some uh, very far right uh, magazines, which actually say the refugees come, they invade Poland, uh, thousands of Arabs will invade Poland and so on. This is the rhetorics that was very much uh, visible in 2015 uh, everywhere. And you'll see in a moment how it actually influenced social attitudes. In 2019 elections, the government uh, used exactly the same methods, the same uh, concepts, uh, just chose the different other group, right? And LGBTIQ plus community um, became um, the biggest enemy. 
Um, you can even see that uh, sometimes uh, the, the phrases, the, um, the, the magazines, the, the concepts were exactly the same, just the group was different. And if I can ask for the next slide. Um, I would like now to show you some statistics, and I'm sorry that this is fully in Polish, but I will, of course, explain now what uh, it uh, says. Uh, so these are actually very interesting uh, poll results conducted for the Commissioner for Human Rights in 2020 for the report on uh, social um, perspective on discrimination. The question asked to the group was uh, very simple. So whether you would like to have Ukrainian person, Muslim person, gay or mentally disabled person as um, someone living in Poland and having citizens rights, then as someone teaching your children at school, uh, as your neighbor, as your co-worker and as someone taking care of you in the hospital. Uh, and the ones uh, which are red are answers yes, the gray one is no. Uh, so I will not go into the details, but uh, the main, I would say, uh, result of this survey is that uh, from all these four uh, mentioned groups, uh, people were uh, most open toward Ukrainians and the least open towards uh, Muslim persons, like somewhere in between were gay and uh, mentally disabled people. Uh, and, uh, well, I think that it is a very interesting, um, I would say, result also in the view of discussing uh, the social attitudes towards migrants. Uh, clearly, um, people in Poland do not have anything against foreigners moving to Poland and living there. What is the problem is uh, the prejudice built around the word refugee itself, because people do not consider Ukrainians refugees. Uh, and again, the other thing, of course, the uh, cultural differences. So the whole hate rhetorics built around refugees, uh, particularly uh, people with, um, with Muslim background, uh, also result uh, in, in these kind of social attitudes. Uh, and on the next slide, please. Uh, there are actually some polls results uh, specifically focused on the refugees. The question was, as you can see, are you in favor of welcoming refugees in Poland? Uh, and uh, what I would like to specifically mention here is how these social attitudes changed over the years. So you can see that in 2015, early 2015, and this is important because that was actually before the whole hate campaign, uh, which I've mentioned, uh, really the huge majority of asked persons were absolutely fine with welcoming refugees. That significantly changed in 2017, also due to, um, I would say, political events around uh, Europe and um, situation around migration, uh, but actually started to grow again as during 2020 and 2021, uh, this, um, this hate campaign was focused on LGBTIQ plus community, not migrants. So uh, in 2021, the results are slightly better than in 2017. I'm a little bit afraid that the same poll conducted now in November would already show again worse results, considering the fact that now during to the situation uh, on the border with Belarus, uh, again, public media are uh, full of, uh, of hate rhetorics uh, towards uh, refugees. And the next slide, please. Uh, actually, we jump to a social attitudes towards LGBTIQ plus community per se. Um, here are, um, I would say, uh, results of uh, the same polls uh, conducted over the years. Uh, maybe the differences are not uh, that huge, but actually what I would like to stress is that uh, uh, the, the gray bar, so the one which says 24% in 2019, uh, this is the question like whether you consider um, people being homosexual to be normal and uh, to, to be not normal and to not be tol tolerated. So 24% people answered yes to that question. And I'm um, really worried with these results because uh, I consider that very high number. And uh, the next slide, please, uh, is actually uh, showing um, the results of uh, the very big uh, fundamental rights agency survey conducted in 2020 among the members of LGBTIQ plus community. Uh, so the results of Poland were in all the questions asked much worse than the average EU. Uh, so I would say the main conclusions are that uh, really the majority of uh, community members in Poland are afraid to hold hands with their partners in public, are afraid that they might be discriminated or harassed, or also the number of people who are actually discriminated and harassed are also very high. 
Uh, and the next slide, please. Um, these are just some examples of how this uh, hate campaign and rhetorics uh, is transferred into practice in a sense. So, of course, a uh, very well-known case of uh, LGBTI freedom zones. Also, the very recent example of uh, the, the citizen uh, project bill, uh, Stop LGBT+, Plus, which um, aims to forbid actually pride marches. Uh, and then um, the, the sticker, which you can show, that was also something published, I think, on Twitter by one of the government officials. So uh, these are just examples of how uh, this uh, hate um, realizes itself, I would say. Uh, but uh, then what I would like to also mention in my presentation uh, is, of course, this legal perspective. So if we can jump to the next slide. And um, I consider this kind of uh, social prejudice to be a certain test for the legal system and protection from discrimination, right? Because if these kind of things happen, uh, it shows how effective the legal system is to actually um, uh, prevent it. And um, in, in that case, what is uh, highly important is protection from discrimination and also hate crimes and hate speech. And here is where important differences between LGBTIQ plus community and refugees come in. Because actually, uh, when it comes to protection of LGBTIQ plus human rights in Poland, there are significant legal gaps in the system of protection. And these two areas, so discrimination and hate crimes and hate speech, are a very clear one to show that. So on the next slide, please, uh, we can see um, like a very overview of uh, the Act on Equal Treatment in Poland. And... Uh, actually protection uh, from, uh, well, discrimination uh, based on sexual orientation is actually forbidden in that act only on, in the area of employment, while uh, discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, nationality, or citizenship is forbidden in all the mentioned areas. So I will not go into details why it is that. However, like this table, I think, clearly shows that uh, really the act on equal treatment has significant gaps and uh, sexual orientation is one of these areas which would need uh, certainly to be amended. And then uh, on the next slide are some uh, examples of um, the articles from Polish uh, Penal Code. Uh, again, uh, that refers to hate crimes and hate speech, uh, which are actually in Poland considered to be uh, more severe and specific types of crimes only when they are uh, conducted on the, well, because of prejudice towards uh, nationality, ethnicity, race, or religion identity. Uh, so if someone commits hate crime or hate speech towards uh, LGBTIQ plus community member on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, this is not considered to be a hate crime in our penal code. It, not, it doesn't mean that it is allowed. Of course, there are still constitutional provisions, for example, that can uh, guarantee protection, but the penal code itself doesn't consider it to be a hate crime. And if we can jump to the next slide, because uh, these two mentioned areas, so discrimination and hate crimes and hate speech, are actually um, for years um, considered by in ILGA Europe in the yearly Rainbow uh, Europe Index map uh, to be the areas where Poland gets 0% of uh, points. Uh, in general, Poland, uh, in the latest um, Rainbow Europe Index, so in 2021, uh, is uh, the EU country with the least number of points. And among all 49 European uh, countries considered, uh, it holds 43rd place. Uh, so it is very low. It is actually low than in the previous years. Uh, and um, besides the two areas which I've already mentioned, so discrimination and hate crimes, uh, also, we yearly get zero points for um, family rights. This is due to the fact that the, in Poland, there is not only no marriage equality, but also no recognition of civil partnerships or like any way to legally recognize uh, same-sex partnerships. There is, of course, also no second parent adoption, no joint adoption. Uh, also, a lot of difficulties with um, recognizing family relations uh, established in the other EU member states when someone moves, moves back to Poland. Uh, there are also um, lots of problems that trans community is facing. Um, legal gender recognition is possible, but it is uh, very difficult um, in like highly human rights violating procedure, I would say. Uh, so, um, well, we get some points uh, in the index for that area, but uh, certainly not um, it's not looking as it should be. And uh, if we can jump to the next slide, um, what I would like to mention is uh, that 
what I've discussed um, a moment ago. So I would say the legal overview of the situation of LGBTIQ plus community is a little bit different from, I would say, the legal situation of uh, refugees and migrants. So the difference is that while um, in the LGBTIQ plus human rights protection, there are mostly significant legal gaps, so no legislation. Uh, when it comes to the situation of refugees uh, and asylum seekers, uh, well, the legislation is there, the rules are there. Uh, what is wrong is uh, how these laws are used. So all the misuses and abuses of law uh, by the state. And um, the example could be that uh, just the uh, proceeding itself to obtain the refugee status, uh, which according to the law should last maximum six months, uh, in practice, it usually lasts 14 and a half months and sometimes even two years. Uh, for example, the other case of uh, conditions in uh, detention facilities for migrants, uh, so the rules are there, uh, but the recent, for example, um, inspections conducted by the National Torture Prevention Mechanism, so this is like the part, the unit of the Ombudsman Office, uh, found out that uh, the conditions are um, well, actually, far from meeting the standards, and uh, that they that they can aggravate trauma. Um, they mentioned, for example, bars installed in the windows. Not even mentioning that the facilities are overcrowded. There are very bad living conditions. Toilets can be half open and in the middle of the room, which actually guarantees no uh, privacy. So the conclusions were that, um, yes, that they, they are far from meeting um, Polish law requirements, not even speaking about international requirements. And uh, jumping to the next slide, and at the same time to the sort of summary as I'm running out of time, uh, I wanted to mention that there are three ways, I would say, that Poland violates currently international standards, uh, which apply, of course, in Poland as well. Uh, but uh, first way, are the legal gaps. So the case mostly of LGBTQ plus community where, as I said, there are no provisions. Then the second example is the practice of, uh, of state actors. So the laws are there, but then um, yeah, they are applied wrongly. And the third case is actually the violation of international standards in the Polish national legislation itself. Uh, this is, of course, from the legal perspective, the most dangerous example, because this is the case where we actually have national law which violates international law. And example here can be the latest um, change in Polish legal system, which um, actually legalized uh, pushbacks in the context of the situation of um, on the Belarusian border. Uh, so to answer the question on the next slide, please, uh, what could be the solution? And to already introduce maybe shortly discussion, which we can have uh, in the breakout room or during the Q&A. Of course, there are ways to make it better. And there is like a huge work of civil society organization, which I have also a great honor to represent right now. And uh, there is endless support needed for these organizations and for the ways of strengthening our collaboration. Uh, also, as a lawyer, I always have to mention strategic litigation because I consider it to be a very powerful tool, not only on the national ground, but also in the international courts. And this is, of course, an area where support is also very much welcomed. There are lots of mechanisms like amicus curiae uh, interventions, which can be submitted to the courts uh, by um, states in the um, Luxembourg court and, uh, of course, by non-government organizations as well. Uh, there's a way of international pressuring, um, again, on the state level and non-state level, and I'm also very happy to discuss that a little bit. And yeah, in general, something that can be called international collaboration. I think this is our way forward to make the situation better. And I'm very sorry for drawing this um, probably a little bit, bit black picture, but I hope that these uh, few ideas in the end will not leave you with only um, bad thoughts about uh, what I've been speaking about, but I thought that it's very important to give you also this overview. Thank you. Thank you, Melina, for this powerful presentation and uh, letting us know what is the legal situation in the country regarding LGBTIQ plus people and uh, with regard to also refugees. So now I will move on to my our, our next uh, speaker. They are Tina Kolosh Orban and they are going to present uh, their topic on the trans refugees in Hungary. Uh, thank you, Tina, for being here today once again. Uh, the stage is yours. 
Thank you, Lilith, and I want to thank uh, the Queer European Asylum Network for organizing this very interesting seminar today. And also, I am honored to be here and, and to talk about the issues that trans asylum seekers and refugees face in Hungary. I'm waiting for my presentation, which has the title of Queer Asylum and the EU Return System, Challenges and Risks. And we can, yes, jump to the, to the second page where I had included some facts around Transponil Law, which is a, an organization which started around 2007 in Hungary as a very grassroots group. And we were established officially in 2011 and registered next year by authorities. Transponilo is the only active and registered NGO in the country who is focusing mostly on trans issues. We are still a very much community-based but trans rights advocacy organization and we provide support services for trans people and their loved ones. And as you can see, I'm not a legal expert. I'm not even, I don't consider myself to be an expert on asylum, but I consider myself to be an expert on trans issues. And the first asylum case that we provided assistance with Transponilla was in 2013, so eight years ago. We are in contact with asylum seekers to who are trans and who happened to to arrive to Hungary. And I will later share more details around that with you. And I am the vice president of the organization and I'm responsible for international relations and advocacy we do. So on, on the next slide, uh, I, I have put together some basic information, I think, which, which uh, provide a basis for the things that I would like to share. So there is a common European asylum system system which sets minimum standards for the treatment of all asylum seekers and their claims in all of the European Union member states. It, there are references to such issues, there are general provisions that affect how LGBT plus people experience asylum in the EU, and in theory, all asylum seekers should face similar situation of how they and their cases are treated across the EU. So it's um, it's basically logical that uh, the Dublin regulation makes sense. That's a system to determine the member state responsible for examining a given asylum application. And in theory, the situation is the same or somewhat similar in, in all the countries. And on the next slide, I, I have uh, I, I will present what trans and gender diverse asylum seekers need wherever they apply for asylum. And I use trans and gender diverse because of the global context of it. In, in Hungary, we mostly talk about trans and gender non-conformed people, but I believe this, I believe that this terminology is more adaptive to the global situation because, because the binary system that we do have in the EU is not the same all around on, on, on our globe. So the basis for the claims of trans and gender diverse asylum seekers might be related to their gender identity or gender expression and might not. But irrelevant to that fact, they all need a safe place to stay and they do need some privacy. And that is the very first thing that uh, asylum seekers face when they, when they arrive somewhere and they apply for asylum. And it's... Uh, it's in many countries in Europe, it's, it's not given. In Hungary, there have been years when there have been containers on the border of Serbia and then everyone was just together there and people were not allowed to leave that area for, for months. So a trans and gender diverse person under those circumstances just had no privacy. And the trans people might need specific healthcare during the whole procedure from the very first day that they arrived up until the long months and years until their claim is assessed. It's not a given in, in many countries, and it's not just Eastern Europe, it's not a given. People just don't have access to, to healthcare. And if someone has started hormone therapy in their country of origin, that is putting the person in risk or someone is HIV positive, or I could sell many things. It, it's not just trans-specific issues, but for example, hormone therapy is a very trans-specific issue. And trans and gender diverse asylum seekers also need officials whom they meet who are aware of their issues, who are trained on, on their issues, who, who have seen trans people before, who, who have some idea who they are. And on the next slide, I present uh, some issues which we are all aware of, but I think it's, it's, 
it's important to say them again and again all the time. It is difficult to leave the country of origin for everyone and for trans and gender diverse people too. It might be very expensive, so it costs a lot. It might be dangerous. In some contexts, to leave your country, it is not that easy and, and you can be caught and, and punished. And in, in some cases, in certain countries, travel is banned for the wider LGBTQ community. If authorities find out that someone belongs to the community, they will not let them travel because of the fear that they will seek asylum somewhere else. So after leaving the country of origin, taking all the risks, hoping that they will come to a region where they will be safe, then they are meeting with challenges. And I will describe them on the next slide. First thing, which I have already mentioned, how authorities detect trans status. It depends on, on different countries, contexts, and people. But it's important to highlight that there is no universal way. Individual assessment in these cases is key, and biases, stereotypes, and Western views on sexuality and gender play a great role. During the interview, there should be specific guidelines available for those who are interviewing LGBTI persons, and applicants should feel safe and respected. When it comes to accommodation, preventive measures are important. Transfers to single rooms should happen before abuse and harassment happens. As I said, trans-specific healthcare is also key and there should have access be provided. Legal gender recognition is another issue because if the recognition of the identity of the asylum seeker is not respected as soon as possible, then that person will not feel safe and, and will feel good. So on the next slide, I will talk about what happens in practice when someone is transferred, for example, to Hungary. So in 2013, the first asylum seeker we got aware of was via an LGBT organization from a Nordic country who informed us that a trans asylum seeker will be transferred to Hungary. We had no idea what is going on. I went to the airport myself to welcome the person. I couldn't welcome the person because he was immediately transferred to, to the authorities. So I had to go there and I had to wait hours because he was first interviewed and, and I couldn't enter and meet him. So in hostile environments, a lot depends on the officer who handles the case. And, uh, and in our cases, when we had experience with asylum seekers, we were lucky because interviewers did understand issues and, and the individual story, stories did matter. So once we got through the interview, I personally had to talk to the officer and I was involved in finding a solution for the accommodation for the person because earth authorities could provide nothing. The person was supposed to send to a camp, but that was just not safe for him. So I personally guaranteed that if he is not transferred to a camp, I will take care of him. I think that's not the solution that civil society should use, but there was just no other option. And the person is still in Hungary, was granted refugee status. No one recognized his gender and has no access to trans-specific healthcare. So the person found a country which uh, gave him refuge, but then her trans status, which has played a role in being harassed in the country of origin, is just not recognized by authorities. And um, then talk about uh, in a bit, on the next slide, I will show you pictures which might not feel you warm, but I think it's important that uh, the experience in Hungary is that your story matters, as I said. I have no evidence that authorities did discriminate based on gender identity of applicants. It doesn't mean it did not happen, but I just don't know about that. But no safety is provided. You have to stay with other asylum seekers and you receive a private room, etc. During the big influx of refugees. I know of trans refugees who were staying in camps and were not safe, but there was just no option to leave the camp. And I know about refugees who have left the country before their application was assessed and chose to stay in Western Europe undocumented because that felt safer or better or whatever. And I believe that shows that no recognition and no healthcare in certain countries is, is, has a, has is playing a great role in, in 
in asylum seekers choosing not to stay in the country where that can only apply for asylum in Europe, but people choose to say not to stay. I don't know which one is safer, no one knows, but the decision is that they leave the country and, and they just go undocumented. And on the next slide, I just want to say that what are the risks, I believe, of being deported to a country where hatred is on the rise? Hungary and Poland, definitely two of these. And I believe that uh, transferring back and applying the Dublin regulation in, to these countries is putting the life of trans people in risk. That, that is just what, what we are playing with when, when, we, when we apply the regulation, which in theory looks good and might, have, might work if the situation would be like it is described, but the minimum standards of protection are just not provided. So I think uh, on the next slide, what would be needed is that the common European asylum system should ensure the same procedure in every member state. And if that's not possible, and I believe that is not possible today, until there's no application of the Dublin regulation in cases of trans or gender diverse asylum seekers to the countries which are which are not welcoming them and which are putting their lives in danger. Uh, okay, so I think that was my intervention, and I'm looking very much looking forward to our discussion in, in the breakout rooms because it will be interesting to hear from everyone and, and to talk about things and issues. Thank you, Tina Kolosh. Uh, your input is amazing and I am really uh, happy to know that you have been working with uh, trans refugees in that uh, area. It's, uh, it's an honor to have you here with us. Uh, and thank you a lot, even be, uh, because you are also having some issues with the, with your health, still you came to present uh, the, your topic. Thanks a lot once again. So last but not the least, I would like to go to Biljana Genova, and uh, they are going to present their topic on the West Balkan countries and have a, um, a discussion with us. Thank you, Biljana, for being here today. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, Lilith. Um, and thank you for inviting me to, to this online symposium uh, to speak on behalf of on my organization, ERA. Uh, the, the name of our organization is LGBTI Equal Rights Association for Western Balkans and Turkey. Uh, and before I start talking, uh, before I start sharing my intervention, I'd like to share a few words about us, who we are, for those who don't know us. Uh, we are an association of 74 currently LGBTIQ member organizations coming from nine countries in Western Balkan and Turkey. Our mission is to inspire positive change in society, to promote and advocate for the human rights of people of all sexual orientations, gender identities, expressions, and sex characteristics by facilitating cooperation among all relevant stakeholders and ensuring sustainable and resilient LGBTIQ movement in the region. As you can guess, I was reading this. <laughs> I didn't know it by heart, but I wanted you to know what is our mission and where are we uh, placed. Uh, however, uh, this undoubtedly includes LGBTIQ refugees, migrants, and asylum uh, seekers. I would also like to point out that we at ERA uh, do not engage directly uh, with any of the, um, of the populations. However, we do uh, provide uh, support to our member organizations uh, in their work, uh, who are actually working directly with all LGBTIQ populations mm, uh, in the region. And uh, we provide the support uh, mainly through supporting their advocacy efforts, uh, strengthening capacities, ensuring collaborations with partners in the region and internationally, with providing financial support um, uh, and similar. Uh, so that's why my intervention here is basing on the reports of our member organizations, but also on the reports of other international organizations who are working on the field of, field of LGBTIQ, uh, refugees, asylum seekers, and uh, migrants. And those reports are mainly showing that um, 
uh, they are reporting that uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex and queer people around the world uh, are facing severe violations of their human rights on account of their SOGS uh, characteristics. Uh, most of them are fleeing their country, uh, running away from violence, discrimination and harassment only very often to face all those oppressions uh, while en route, at the borders, at the reception, or at the final uh, destinations. Um, sexual and gender minorities, as it was stated also uh, earlier by Milena, they have rights to seek international protections when their rights uh, and well-being is in danger. However, According to the Fundamental Rights Association uh, reports, uh, the implementation of EU asylum directives varies significantly across the region. Uh, Fra notes that, uh, for example, there are no official statistics of the number of asylum claims based on the sexual orientation and uh, gender identity, which makes it much more difficult to tailor uh, the service based on the actual needs of asylum uh, seekers. Uh, we are talking here about the structural or systematic solutions, not uh, ad hoc uh, interventions coming usually from LGBTIQ organizations. Uh, only a few uh, European member states have specific national guidelines for interviewing LGBTIQ people, leaving the vast majority without proper access to care and protection. Uh, civil society representatives uh, note that eligibility interviews are often too short and lack of any specific attention to uh, persecution based on sexual orientation and gender identity. According to the NGOs, asylum officers tend to have quite uh, stereotypical views on uh, sexual orientation and on gender identity that they are imposing on the, uh, on the people who are interviewed. In most of the EU member states, there are no special accommodation facilities for LGBTIQ uh, people. Uh, often, there are some um, uh, special measures that these states are taking, and especially when uh, there is a documented case of violence or, or harassment, and in that, that case, these people are removed in uh, single rooms or isolated areas. However, um, uh, these systems are lacking of any preventive measures of this kind of violence or harassment incidents uh, to happen in the first uh, place. Um, it goes in this line that most of the incidents of violence and harassment um, uh, by bias against LGBTIQ uh, asylum seekers are not reported and they are not recorded and uh, that's why they um, these people are uh, living in this kind of conditions for a quite prolonged uh, uh, time. There are insufficient guidelines on providing spe specific health care, especially hormonal therapy or HIV uh, medicines to um, LGBTIQ people and particularly to transgender people who already start their treatments in their countries. And this, uh, of course, we all know that can have um, severe consequences on their health and their well-being on a long uh, run. Uh, in this line of um, concerns, uh, these lines of concerns shares also the Council of Europe, uh, who has documented that the international standards are uh, interpreted, uh, are inter, uh, are applied differently in different European countries. Uh, which in some cases prevents LGBTI asylum seekers from being granted the protection they, uh, they need. Uh, the reports from our partner organizations uh, who work in the region confirm that the majority of LGBTIQ asylum seekers in the Western Balkan are facing a lack of uh, any LGBTI specific services. Uh, they face lack of support in the integration process, lack of communication with LGBTI specialized organization, lack of access to health services, including general healthcare and specific healthcare, such as trans-specific and HIV treatment. Uh, and again, I'm talking about systematic solutions, not about ad hoc interventions from certain LGBTIQ or human rights uh, organizations. Of course, these challenges have been significantly accelerated in the time of COVID pandemic, uh, 
uh, hopefully we are seeing the end of this pandemic, but the years that has passed, they imposed uh, significant threats to the LGBTIQ refugees, migrants and asylum seekers. Um, our organizations, as well as the international community, including the Queer European Asylum Network, has concluded that the pandemic um, uh, that during the pandemic, uh, there was a higher risk of isolation and trauma re-triggering for uh, uh, queer uh, refugees, migrants, and asylum uh, seekers. They, they faced with overcrowded centers, and they've been exposed to even greater um, violence and harassment. And of course, as it was uh, stated in pre-pandemic and after pandemic uh, time, uh, during the pandemic, the access to healthcare uh, was almost uh, completely cut, uh, especially for trans-specific health, uh, considered as not priority over the pandemic, uh, which of course had uh, severe consequences for the transgender people. Uh, the final point that I want to make today uh, is uh, about the, uh, the documented or visible rise of the um, uh, alt-right and anti-right uh, movements. Uh, in our region, uh, in the recent years, we are witnessing constantly increasing presence of so-called anti-gender narratives that mainly attack the gender equality and LGBTI. However, the analysis of these groups show that in the context of Western Balkans and in the context of Eastern Europe, more often than not, these groups are interlinked uh, with many other anti-rights groups, such as anti-refugees or anti-vaccines or anti-5G. Uh, that is a little bit different from, the, from what we see in Western Europe or in the Global North. However, here in this part of the, the world, these groups are very inter, uh, interlinked. Many of them even come from completely different uh, ideological background. Uh, and many times the motivation that each of these groups have is very different. However, they, um, it, it seems that it's very easy for them to unite in the hatred against LGBTIQ people, uh, hatred against refugees, or hatred against anyone who does not fit in the in their cis heteronormative uh, and patriarchal worldview. Uh, what is important to know about these groups is um, no matter how much they present themselves, because they do present themselves as somebody who is protecting our children, who is protecting the future, who is protecting the normalcy uh, in the society, we must remember that their final objective is to uh, deteriorate the democratic processes and human rights principles in the society. Their aim, is uh, to, uh, I mean, I quote this uh, several different reports, um, uh, but their aim is to deteriorate the democratic, uh, their aim, I'm sorry, is to preserve the domination of one population over the others. And of course that population uh, whose power is preserved uh, with help of this movement is the one of the white, rich, heterosexual, cisgender men coming from the uh, global north over the rest, and um, in doing so, they are taking different avenues. And most uh, often, the avenues they're taking are direct attacks to people coming from gender and sexual minorities, and particularly those who come uh, from intersectional backgrounds, uh, such as queer refugees, migrants, and asylum uh, seekers. Uh, I could go on a little bit longer, but I, I think it's better if we continue this discussion in the, uh, the small group. And before we move there, uh, and having all this in mind that I shared today, I would like to uh, share a few, uh, two sets of recommendations, and maybe they can be used as initiation in the discussion later on. So one set of the recommendation I'm uh, giving for the states, uh, and the other one is for our, our movement. So the recommendation for the states, um, based on the communication with our members, are that states uh, should ensure that uh, the laws explicitly recognize a well-funded fear of persecution on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex characteristic as valid grounds for recognition 
as a refugee. Second, uh, the states to introduce mandatory training on LGBTIQ specific issues and concerns for all those involved in the asylum uh, procedures. Third, uh, the states to ensure access to fair asylum procedures for LGBTIQ asylum seekers. They must ensure uninterrupted access to healthcare, uh, primary and secondary, and other services needed uh, from LGBTIQ asylum seekers. And the states must ensure the safety and the well being of the LGBTIQ asylum seekers by providing safe accommodation uh, and adequately documenting and prosecuting the cases of violence and harassments against the asylum uh, seekers because of their SOGS uh, status. And finally, the recommendations for the for our movements, LGBTIQ and the movements of refugees, migrants and asylum seekers. Um, I think, and I will start that uh, we as movements are natural allies and that we should find each and every way to support uh, each other's work, especially by sharing expertise and by sharing um, knowledge and resources. When possible, uh, LGBTIQ organizations to introduce programs for support of refugees, migrants and asylum seekers, and to do so in partnership with specialized organizations human and human rights lawyers who are working in this uh, field. And finally, and I will end with this, um, as I said, the rights of alt-rights and anti-rights uh, groups and their narratives uh, that are occupying our public discourse are mainly directed to LGBTIQ people, particularly transgender people and against refugees, migrants and asylum seekers. Thus, countering these uh, groups uh, or uh, creating responses to these narratives feels like a um, uh, meeting place for building uh, networks of solidarity among all these uh, movements. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, and I hope we can continue this conversation in the small group. Thank you so much, um, Biljana. And I think you already gave the perfect um, um, ending of that very insightful, very dense um, interventions. We are moving back. Uh, from our breakout rooms, at least we in our room had a very, very intensive discussions and already some really, really interesting ideas. Um, Lilith, do you want to to start? Yeah, I'm just uh, compiling the last words. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> so Lilith isn't starting. So maybe, Knut, do you want to report from your working group? Just... Uh, give us an impression what you were talking about. Um, well, what what would I say? Uh, the thing is that we had a absolutely interesting discussion where we exchanged information. We don't have uh, maybe something um, to add now to the list, um, any advisory, but um, we were mostly discussing discussing the topic of uh, family. Um, how that is so different in the European countries and especially that uh, Poland doesn't recognize even a married couple coming from other parts of uh, same-sex married couple coming from other parts of Europe. I didn't know this or I didn't think about it and this is uh, an information which I would like to share here as well. Yeah, other than that... Um, we saw that the challenges um, which the queer asylum seekers face are actually quite similar in all European countries. So identification, um, you would be living together with the homophobic environment in a homophobic environment. All these topics we know here in Germany as well as in Hungary or Poland or other countries um, but the difference is that the infrastructure is better and also again the legal gaps which Milena spoke about um, wouldn't exist here in Germany for example this is something which we also um, discussed again yeah but that's what I would like to 
share with you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, just jump in on one thing, because I think this is something that will stick with me now for the whole day, that Philip Brown just introduces to um, the technique of online marriages in Utah, um, that there has been a marriage concluded in Utah with the absence of both uh, partners. And this is something that the German government is recognizing in Germany, where eventually, essentially, same-sex people like anyone else could get married in Germany and then have a recognized marriage in Germany. And obviously the question is like, what would that mean anyways for, you know, for migration, but also in this particular asylum context and then thinking about ways in which, all right, you get married in Germany, but you might end up in Poland where your marriage is again, not recognized, but you could get married again to a heterosexual person or enter a heterosexual marriage, put it that way. So. I found this really fascinating, and I'm kind of really thinking about this now. Nina, watch out. Um, to have online marriages, my recommendation <laughs> would be put online marriages as an, you know, as an option for people to seek reunification. Why not? That is already very beautiful. You know, we, we see we are getting creative here. Um, Lilith, <laughs> <laughs> handing over to you, your group. Thank you. Um, yeah, in our group, we also talked about a couple of things. It was also not uh, something I would call in the in the direction of recommendations. Rather, it was more about the exchange of the current situations uh, in Hungary, in Germany, and overall in Europe. And what we saw is that there is a lot of gatekeeping when it comes to changing the laws in the region. And this gatekeeping is done mostly by politicians and also by the bureaucracy. And this gatekeeping has to end and we need to have more representation in the, in the bureaucracy as well as in, in the politics so that our voices are also heard. And last but not the least, I had the idea um, uh, also uh, in the group before that what would happen if we can actually inform our um, European parliamentarians and tell them, hello, look, you are uh, here, the representatives of the people. Can you do something about the issues that we are facing in the country? And to that, uh, uh, Tina's answer was, it is more, uh, it is better to have commissioners and commissions to take these duties and uh, implement the changes in the area. And uh, then we also talked about, uh, uh, because uh, the, the countries are not even implementing the EU's directives, the countries are not even implementing their own legal uh, um, system, their own uh, um, legal uh, paradigms. And then we uh, think that maybe there will be an outside pressure that could help them to conform to that because these are legal issues. And last but not least, uh, there was one more thing and that is we have lack of data. We do not have statistics. It's a very grave mistake that has been done by the European Union in general and also the member states uh, specifically that we do not carry out any specific data when it comes to uh, Sojika, uh, asylum seeking people uh, who are returned to other countries on the basis of Dublin three regulations. Do they get enough uh, uh, assistance if they are being deported back to the country? Are there any organizations which are also then informed? Look, we have an LGBTI person because of Dublin three, they have to be deported. So can you refer them to an organization? No, there is no such system in place. So starting from the scratch, I think uh, this second panel has, uh, has shown us that we need more uh, things to be placed in the system at first. And then we can come to a level where we can talk about, oh, you did not do your uh, things properly. First, we need to have an infrastructure and we need to have a proper uh, data collection system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lilith. Um, now going to our group. Um, I made some notes. Um, Gesa, Biliana, do you want to talk first about your ideas or should, or should I start? You can start. Okay. Yeah, you. 
Okay, perfect. Stop for us. And... I'm very happy. <laughs> Okay, then um, we also discussed, I mean, one major point that was already mentioned by Lilith um, is like um, lobbying for strengthening um, the implementation of legislation and also strengthening European monitoring, how we can check if laws are really implemented and demanding the implementation of legislation um, also by LGBTIQ communities. One um, other important aspect was uh, the question of um, allyship um, in Europe. Um, net, that means to have stronger networks, to, to have forums, and this is here only a starting point where we can actually learn from each other, connect with each other, understand each other's um, issues better. And I think this is um, needed much, much more that these people working on the ground in different countries um, on the issue of LGBTIQ asylum and um, working together with LGBTIQ refu refugees and asylum seekers, that they are, know each other and their local issues much, much more closely. And so also um, in focusing on allyship, how um, organizations from countries who are maybe more, a little bit better funded, and or have a little bit more experience already, um, it can maybe help other um, organizations in other countries because I, I think models that were work now in one country can also be maybe transferred to another country, um, let's say, and, and this is again, there would be of course needed much, much, much more European funding in those countries to have, for example, projects like we have in Germany, the queer, um, um, the project of LSVD, the project of Bundesstiftung Magnus Hirschfeld, that we have projects like this who connect um, researchers, um, who connect the community and experts with governmental organizations to create learning opportunities for people in, in the governmental sector on these issues. Um, um, these um, projects are needed in every European country and there we should put pressure also on a European level that this is, um, that this should be established, that th something like this is necessary European wide. Um, so that was a factor of capacity building and also what was also mentioned in, in, in our context is of course, political pr pressure through parliamentarians, also local parliamentarians of the European Parliament, um, but also, for example, um, city friendships, partnerships between different European cities. There, for example, could be also established a capacity building exchange between LGBTIQ organizations in one city and their partner cities um, in another city. And um, that may be also through funds by um, by um, authorities in 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 one of the countries that has actually a little bit more money to support these kind of structures. These just a, f a first few ideas from I noted. Do you have something to add, Biliana, um, Gisa, and the others in our group? Um, Daniel, I think you covered it all and thank you very much. I just want to add one thing that I did not manage to, to comment it there. We had to move mm -hmm. in the plenary. You were talking about the importance of establishing and maintaining financially these kind of structures where all relevant actors in one country who mm -hmm. all relevant actors for uh, asylum are on one uh, place. I just wanted to comment that while establishing and supporting this kind of structures, it is important all the time to check who is not at the table and to make everything possible to include them. I know that this sounds like repeating all the time, all the time, but we still even now are seeing these kind of groups. Uh, and for example, I know that when the Commission for Refugees, uh, the State Commission for Refugees was established in North Macedonia, there was no uh, organization working with LGBTIQ sitting there. There was no organization of people with disabilities sitting there or any other specificities. There were only two organizations uh, who did not have expertise or knowledge to cover all these um, uh, 
uh, information or concerns by these uh, uh, populations. And I would like to end that very few in this context of asylum, very few officers, state officers are understanding intersectional discrimination. And that is the key um, uh, for queer uh, refugees and queer asylum uh, seekers, especially those who come um, with trans experience or those who come with uh, disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. It goes uh, even further. I just wanted to share it before we, uh, we, we before we end this panel. Thank you so much, Biljana. And for, I think, are there other comments? If not, I would hand over to Lilith. Thank you, Daniel. I would still encourage people, we still have a couple of minutes if there is any question or if there is any remark regarding the breakout rooms or the discussion in general, you are most, uh, most welcome. So if that is, yeah, sure. Please, Usman. Hi, um, <clears throat> so, hi. can everybody hear me? Okay, hi. Uh, so I am, I guess like not a representative, but I'm like from the Western Europe, Western North Europe, <laughs> so Britain. I'm sitting in London at the moment. And I was very, um, first of all, thank you for having all these wonderful discussions. I think I've learned a lot. Um, just because we are on the topic and considering where Britain is right now in regard to the rest of the Europe, <laughs> you know, let's not get into it, but we all know. Uh, what can the LGBTQ activists from our end in Britain do that would help you in the, the I, and I'm just saying that because um, somebody brought up that point, uh, I think it was you, Daniel, who said that people who have more resources, um, you know, they could help out. And when you think about like, at least it's one of the cities, London is one of the cities, which is seen as the queer capital uh, within London and there's um, resources compared to some other countries uh, and other cities. Um, so what could we do on our end, considering keeping in mind the whole shit show that Brexit is and how it might impact or might not impact the activism, if that makes sense. Thank you, Usman. So, so who would like to answer that? What could the Northwestern European activists do or contribute to the cause? Yeah, sure, Milena. Also, I actually have two ideas, I would say. And the first one is um, like advocating in your country and for your MPs, for example, to um, build international pressure on state actors of respective countries. Because this is, I think, um, in most of cases, very effective way. Uh, to go like a little bit uh, bottom up in a sense. And um, the other idea, well, I don't like to bring it, but it is true that it is always needed and it is financial support because very often um, LGBTIQ plus or well, in general organizations working uh, in human rights uh, in the countries where anti-human rights campaign I, I run are really facing a lot of financial difficulties. And uh, we of course don't get any financial support from the state. Uh, so all our work is basically donation based and um, it is as simple as financial support sometimes. So of course, not always directly, but there are ways of uh, spreading um, uh, also the message uh, among your communities, right? That there are certain ways of, of supporting the way the work on the ground uh, in these states. Thank you, Milena. Uh, I see one other hand from Usman. Yeah, Usman. No, I just wanted to uh, take it very quickly, very far. The first one, Milena, you don't have to be embarrassed about the second point you raised. I think it's a very, it's a very, it's one of those things that you don't want to talk about, but um, money is unfortunately the god of this world, so you have to put up with it. Uh, so don't feel embarrassed about it. The, I just wanted to leave you with this thought. I completely agree with you because one, so the thing with London is that um, Polish community is the second biggest community. And as a result, what we have seen over 
the recent year, especially um, the activist challenge to whatever is happening in Poland, the conservative moves that have been taken. Uh, so there are now Polish LGBTQ activism that is beginning and it's uh, supported uh, by the local activist communities. Uh, the other thing I completely agree with the money wise and I think that could be one of the things um, that could go on while while this is uh, you know being held this conference we could have a think about how we could actually help monetarily um, or what actions could be taken that would help with donations um, from people who could help if that makes sense. Thank you Usman. So uh, I would like to thank all of you guys for being here today and being part of this very interactive and also very important discussion that how we can uh, improve uh, the legal structures as well as the social structures when it comes to uh, migrants, especially refugees who are claiming asylum in most of the countries in Europe. Although Europe does not hold the biggest uh, population of the asylum seekers and the refugees in the world, but still uh, it is a place for LGBTIQ refugees, which offers uh, apparently a safe haven compared to many other countries around the world and that we have also seen in the beginning of uh, today's panel with uh, Irene and uh, their uh, panelists. I would like to thank all my panelists today here. I would like to thank uh, uh, Milena for your work, for your uh, dedication and for your allyship. You are a privileged ally and you also recognize that and accept that that's uh, a uh, very good thing from you. Thanks a lot, Milena, for being here today. I would like to also thank Tina Kolosh, uh, regardless of the health issues, they have been here today and uh, presented their work and also presented the ideas that they wanted to share with us regarding the trans refugees in Hungary. And Biljana, thanks a lot. Uh, Biljana has been also working for quite a lot of years for LGBTIQ persons in general, also sometimes with many of the uh, refugees and also asylum seekers. They have been a very uh, active part uh, when it comes to uh, mobilizing and lobbying in the West Balkan region. And I would also like to thank Knud for bringing up the statistics and also bringing up uh, the, the, your impulse when it's uh, about uh, the deportation from the Germany. It was really eye-opening that how things are being carried out in our country. But in our other countries, uh, it's a different matter. And uh, maybe someday soon, we will be able to have a bigger symposium with all the countries there and sitting like the conference of parties that they have done in Ireland. And then we can come up with something about the LGBTIQ persons in general. And last but not least, I would like to also thank my co-host uh, for today, my co-moderator, Daniel. It's always a pleasure to work with you. And it's a very, um, a very learning experience for me as well. Whenever we work together, I get a lot of information and a lot of new insights into the work that you are doing. And last but not the least, and we should not forget that this uh, entire symposium has been possible with the generous and also a lot of uh, money and sponsoring uh, from Gunda Vena Institute and also the technical support uh, from the Magnus Hirschfeld Stiftung and their dedication and their work that they do behind the scenes. Uh, this symposium looks like it's just four hours. It's not four hours, it's a very long uh, behind the scene preparations, meetings, coming to um, agreements and doing our work uh, or improving our work, I would say. Uh, thank you a lot. I would now leave you all guys exactly at 1.30 p.m. Central European time to go and have your lunch or to go and just relax yourself, enjoy the weather if it's possible and have a very nice and good day. Take care, bye-bye. <laughs>